six months. Um, and he started up the Extropy Institute, has had a like a lot of writing about transhumanism and defined transhumanism in modern philosophy. He's also the uh, the chairman of Elcor. So put your hands together for Max. And also we have Natasha Vita Moore, and I've had the extreme privilege of working for a very professional woman here in helping organize the Humanity Plus Conference in San Francisco, which just happens to be in the next couple of days. So if you haven't bought a ticket, consider to come along if you've got the time to the Humanity Plus at San Francisco. It's going to be at San Francisco State University. You can find out more about it at the 2012, 2012.humanityplus.org. Uh, we'll just show you go to humanityplus.org front page. It'll be linked there. Um, so these people are wonderful, I've, I've dealt with them in the past, interviewed them, very pleasant people and I'm looking forward to what they have to say. So they're bringing out a new book called The Transhumanist Reader and I'll introduce them, I'll bring them back up to the stage here. Um, please come up and uh, begin. I think we're running into something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My favorite motto these days is a critical ideas require discussion. And when I find out in this quick wiki culture of point and click, fast track information, downloadable apps of anything, anything goes, anytime, there's often a lack of referential knowledge, accurate um, and reliable sources of information of where ideas actually come from. It's not that we say that ideas need to be owned. To the contrary, ideas are free, but it's where they come from, the links historically that are valuable to us. And often we forget this because we're so quick to get the latest bit of information. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to work on this book, The Transhumanist Reader, is to bring together the ideas of the early transhumanist seminal thinkers, the original first place holders of concepts that we see bandied around in the press today and oftentimes irregularly. So what we'd like to talk to you about is this book. As far as my own history is concerned, I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto in 1983, which was the first transhuman statement which went on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft uh, some years later. And it was the first time the words, we are transhuman and we can live indefinitely. Uh, was spread across our solar system. That's not known, but it's going to be known in this book. Unfortunately, no one thinks about these things because we're so quick and ready to get with the latest artificial general intelligence, the latest upload, the latest uh, hardware, software, the latest implant, chip, whatever. So our book is to take a look at the scholarship of ideas, where they step from, and the links between them. Um, I'm going to share this discussion with Max, and then we're going to have a little fun bantering back and forth. We're going to tell you about why we wrote this book, why we brought the authors together, why we decided to edit the volume of this book, and why it's so desperately needed. Thank you, darling. A few quick facts. First of all, the full title is too long to remember from my faulty memory, so it is The Transhumanist Reader, Classical and Contemporary Essays on the Science, Technology, and Philosophy of the Human Future. Almost a 19th century title, but not quite. Uh, it's, a, it's a collection of 42 essays which attempt to provide both historical and current perspectives on transhumanism. Uh, MIT Press are going to look very foolish because they ended up dropping that. We, we, actually, the senior editor, that's not his fault, he was very much in favor of this book, but uh, because he had to take it to a committee, he didn't really understand this stuff, and so that ended up not happening. But uh, in, I think, March or April, it will be published by Wiley Blackwell, so we're very happy to get an excellent publisher. The basic structure of the book, Natasha said, you know, people, uh, if you look at the Wikipedia entry on transhumanism, it may not really be entirely accurate, maybe missing things. I think another issue is that different people come to transhumanism from their own perspective. Uh, maybe as an AI researcher, or a nanotechnologist, or a sociologist, or a historian, or a philosopher, and tend to focus on that one aspect. So one goal of this book is to really look at transhumanism as a whole, where it, where it comes from, what it is, what the different elements are. So out of those 42 essays, we essentially group them into nine parts in the book, starting off with roots and core themes, uh, going on to uh, a couple of sections on human enhancement, one on the semantic sphere, enhancements to the body, and then on to the cognitive sphere, uh, core technologies, you can't really have transhumanism without the technologies to make those changes possible. So there we've got pieces by, you know, classic pieces by Minsky and Moravec and Hall and so on. Uh, then we have uh, a section, also pretty crucial, Engines of Life, Identity and Beyond Death. 
where we explore some of the core themes in life extension and identity. Uh, then a chapter, uh, a section on enhanced decision making, because I think as we've seen, especially in the last, the last 10 years or so, increasingly in transhumanism, an emphasis on the, the need to better think very carefully about these ideas, not just to advocate, but to actually really critically assess them, because now the ideas are being heard, heard and accepted far more widely than they were, so rather than just pushing the acceptance of these ideas and the plausibility of them, it's become increasingly important to think critically about them. Uh, then a big chunk on uh, biopolitics and policy. Um, and in fact, we've got two contributors right here. James is one of our contributors in that section. Uh, of course, the section on the singularity idea, since that's been so popular. So, trying to explain what is the singularity, what, what different versions of this idea are about, and how do they relate to transhumanism. I think there's a lot of confusion about that, where people assume that transhumanism is about the singularity. And then finally, the last section, the world's most dangerous idea, based of course on Fukuyama's quote, uh, where we talk about some of the opposition to transhumanism and uh, our replies to it. In putting together an anthology, we had no idea what it was all about. And for those of you writers in the room who have ever attempted to put together an anthology, you know what I'm talking about. We had this idea. And when we closed down Extra Free Institute, the idea started there. And with the other transhumanist organizations, the idea spread even further. And now that I've finished my PhD, what I started noticing is that students keep on emailing me and calling me, asking me to look at their master's dissertation or the PhD dissertation, or just from high school saying, how do I get involved in this? What do I read? And I went through the, the array of books, the smorgasbords of different books from science fiction to science fact, the whole array of what knowledge is available. And I saw this deep gap in bringing it together with the, as I said before, the seminal thinkers, some of the original thinkers of this particular strain of thought. Not the original thinkers over time about the future and space exploration and living longer, etc., which goes back historically to the Taoists and Wopang Yang. But more recently, over the past 20 years, in the scope of this movement, this culture that we're all a part of, or many of us are a part of, but others of us are interested in and looking at it, um, how can we deliver something that has some level of scholarship and efficacy? So we went and we looked at the authors that we wanted in this book, and there were so many more that we did really cherish their ideas, but we had to settle on bringing it down to only 42, which is a vast number of authors. And let me say, getting the essays wasn't the big deal. Editing them, revising them, pulling them together, assorting them, and going... Getting the rights to... <laughs> getting the rights. Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing, those of you who are writers and have been in this situation, I had no idea. I've self-published several books, but I've never been really um, the co-editor of a book like this that, that has this broad scope. And dealing with the essays, I had no idea that there's this whole business over here about rights. And each author that gave us their rights, he or she said, well, I own the rights. I have the copyright permission to it. It's my, my essay. I wrote it. I published it in my book. No, no, no. It's the publisher of that previous book who has the rights. And what we went through to get those rights is, is a whole other story indeed. But it's an interesting um, experience just going through this. I think one of the joys of it is actually getting to the point where it's, it's completed and now we're designing the cover of it. And so we're going back and forth on that. But I think some of the trial and error in actually putting it together it has is it's viable with, with great laughter and tears itself. Actually, the experience of choosing the covers itself kind of interesting because it shows you, I think, what the, at least the, the so-called designers, uh, this publisher have, what they think of transhumanism. I think that some of the original covers, they seem to think it was basically taking a lot of LSD because it was a lot of very bright psychedelic colors on the cover and pretty hard to read it in the title. And then, uh, I don't know, that's the opposite extreme, a very kind of boring academic style. I think we finally got something we're hoping to refine a little bit further, which you know, has, a, has a human image and some technology, but they still try to make it like a tattoo, and it just, I mean, the Tasha's mock-ups, which they did in five minutes, were a lot better than what the designers put together. So. And that's interesting, I mean, you know, I guess when you have a deal with a publisher, they have to bring in their own design team, because I kept on sending them in to say, this is what we're interested in, and they came back with something similar to it, but not quite on the mark, but you know, you have to settle for what, they, what they're choosing but not settle to a point where you're disgusted and don't want to look at it on the show. You, know, you still want to be proud of the cover. Um, at least they let us choose our own title. That's not always the case. Way back in the 90s when I was uh, trying to write a book, actually I did write a book, Wired 
Wired, uh, there was Wired Books back then, this was before they failed to go public twice and uh, cancelled everybody's contract. They'd actually written a fairly modest book, 60,000 words or so, in three months of sitting in Starbucks. And one of the big fights I had with them during that process was uh, the title. They wanted to call it The Augmented Animal. And I said, that's, that's a terrible title. And I thought, can we call it The Accelerated Human? That's better than The Augmented Animal. But they wouldn't budge on that, so uh, at least we got to keep our own title in this book. Um, what we, uh, one, one thing that we're looking at now, um, getting into the final stages of this, this, this great journey, it's been a couple of years. I think going back, it started in 2000, two and a half years, two and a half years. and that seems like a long time, but when, when you look at it and all the steps along the way, it's really nothing. <laughs> um, but I, I think one of the most important things for us to do now is, is to try to get this book to the students, um, not only the students, because it is an academic book, because John Wiley and Sons Publishing is an academic publisher. Uh, we also hope that it's a mainstream book as well because the stories are so rich. I mean, it's not just scholarly essays. There's some great dialogues between um, Ray Kurzweil and Eric Drexler, for example. There is, um, Andrew Sandberg is, has taken one of his talks at one of our conferences and turned it into a very tasty, uh, informative, um, Essay and also there's so we did the same with Marvin Minsky. Where yeah. He gave a talk at one of the Expo conferences, and we didn't really have a paper we wanted to use exactly. But there's that Scientific American one. But we thought, no, let's take his his kind of argumentative, annoying uh, talk because you know how he gives talks. You've ever heard of him? He likes to insult people and say how <laughs> some ideas are completely stupid. So we took that and kind of I mean, heavily edited it and turned that into a paper instead. Right, right. I found um, sometimes when I asked for an essay from an author, I was I said we want it between X number of words and X number of words meaning not too many words, and I got, let's like, say, 5,000 was our maximum, between 3,000 and 5,000 words. I got one essay that was 15,000 words, <laughs> and I had to break that down. Now that took me several days, no noise, no interruption, no phone, no computer, nothing, just sitting in a room, reading through it, trying to reorganize the thought patterns in this very articulate piece of writing into something that was more concretized and something that we thought our readers would enjoy. So just to give an idea of kind of the spread of the essays, uh, it really is a mixture of old and new. And some of the old ones we had to maybe do a little bit of editing on, but um, see some of the older stuff. If you, you know, if you were readers of Extra B magazine way back in the day, you'll recognise some of these pieces, uh, like Mark Miller on uh, some very kind of early thinking about hypertext and uh, multimedia. Um, we've got some medium-term classics like Robert Friedis on nanomedicine. Uh, let's see, going on, some of the old pieces well. Minsky's piece, Why Freud Was the First Good AI Theorist, that was his talk. Um, Hans Moravec's little mini piece, which we just had to have it because of the title, Pigs in Cyberspace. <laughs> Pigs in Cyberspace! <laughs> and then uh, Joss Storsfall on uh, nanocomputers, also from an early extra B issue. Uh, let's see what else we got that's going to early stuff. Oh, Robin Hansen's Idea Futures, going in the decision making section. We had to include that one. And then on the other hand, we have you know, new pieces, or some heavily, heavily reworked ones. Um, Michael Shapiro on performance enhancement and legal theory. That originally was uh, a talk at an extra conference, and he massively revised that for us for the book. Uh, Andy Meyer, uh, new piece on justifying human enhancement. Um, let's see, we've got uh, Martin Rothblatt on transgenderism, transhumanism, and the freedom of form. It's a new piece. Uh, let's see. Something from uh, the IET journal by Patrick Hopkins on it, this enhancement of William being a right, and several other you know, very new, fresh pieces by Russell Blackford, um, Damien Broderick, and so on. I think uh, one of the one of the part three I really enjoy human enhancement in the cognitive sphere. Um, my my area, my work is human enhancement uh, from a philosophical theoretical perspective as well as practice based. But what I really enjoy about this section has Andy Clark, whose work I love, combined with Ben Gertzel and. Alexander Sasha if you all remember Alexander Sasha he was very early transhumanist thinker back in the days of XGB Institute and the XGB email list. And he wrote, he, it was actually his idea to come up with the transhumanist fact way back when in the transhumanist declaration. So that's really exciting to include him in the book since um, he passed away some years ago. And then, of course, Rad McCoy is in the book um, talking about uploading to substrate independent minds. Um, I think there's another one in that section too, and Ralph Merkel, interestingly enough, you know, Ralph with nanotechnology, so he, we have him in that section. 
Um, we try to make it as transdisciplinary as possible, so it's not just technology of the future or the science. It also includes the aesthetic of, uh, appeal, uh, looking at wearable technology and, and where that fits into more the artistic perspective and aesthetics about our future. And that's one area that I think is so important when we're, we're talking about quantified self, numerical self, all these numbers and data all the time. What does it mean? Where is it going? And through this book, we tried to carve it in a way that tells a bit of a story without being pedantic about it. So we carve it as honestly and as richly as we possibly could to give a perspective of where, where these ideas come from. And our hope is that it, it sits as like an encyclopedia of the early ideas that, that can be referential and where they're going um, today. So buy at least 100 copies of your local <laughs> schools and <laughs> Oh, we've got some time for questions here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like, yeah, has anybody got any questions about the up and coming book or just for um, Max and Natasha in general? So, David? Yeah, um, it took you, after being in the business for 30 years, it took you two years to put it together, right? Um, which, which is a huge task. And the way you talk about the book, it, it sounds so immensely rich. What is your expectation? How will the readers be able to usefully approach it, actionably approach it? It is, it is going to be certainly a reference, but how do you think somebody can say, okay, I, I want to wrap myself around it. Is that even possible? Is that, is that something that people, you would want people to do? or, or because I, I see it as a as a starting point for for so much, you know, workshops or whatever else. Do you have in mind what the next steps are? Yeah, very much so. For example, um, James Hughes, um, in his work with IEET and in, and in other um, organizations he's involved in, and he's always being rich. Um, through the IEET email list and telling us where to go to find jobs, where to go to find conferences. He is one of the richest sources of knowledge. So that's very important to us. So that's what we're looking for, a rich um, nexus of ideas and knowledge so that we can bring in people like James from his organization and different organizations together that uh, have knowledge bases to form one large transhumanist knowledge source or knowledge source of transhumanism. We uh, haven't decided on the software, the approach that we're going to use for that. It'll be a major Wikipedia for transhumanism. Um, and open source, but I, you know, it's again going back to Wikipedia. If you look at transhumanism in Wikipedia, um, it's hard to get anything changed on that. And a lot of the information is outdated and a lot of the information is not really correct. It's picking and choosing what whoever's in charge of it wants to say. Um, so what we're hoping is that that it doesn't matter what your ideology is specifically, that's okay, or your gender preference, or your religious views, and none of you know what color your skin is, none of these things matter. The more diversity, multiplicity, the better within transhumanism. But let's get our knowledge correct. Let's get our facts correct and our, our historical links. I think part of the answer to your question uh, is also really our pitch to the publisher, because obviously the publisher is not a charity, so we had to convince them that this book would actually sell a few copies to justify the cost. So we had to go through and think about, okay, which university departments and courses could use this as a textbook? And uh, you know, when you start thinking about it, there's actually a lot of them. Even areas like gender studies might use it. Um, area discussions of technology and society and so on. There's actually quite a few departments that we could you know, at least convince the publisher sufficiently plausibly of could use this as a textbook. So we hope, as you say, it'll be a starting point. It'll be used either in part or in a whole for courses, get students thinking, and they'll follow up on these ideas and drill into the areas that interest them. Maybe some will get really interested in the biopolitics part, others in the life extension, uh, others in the, you know, the philosophical roots. So it is very much a starting point. How many people read the whole thing? Well, I don't know. We should probably give prizes for people who read the whole thing. And another thing that, that, that this, now this is a sidestep to it, but it's interesting how you learn things that you hadn't expected in the first place when you, when you finish a project. Um, I think this book will answer a lot of the, the questions left by the postmodernist agenda, which has always been, um, within this past few decades, a bit anti-transhumanist in scope. It's, it's always been like, you know, Postmodernism and then posthumanism, and then transhumanism is always the the, the closet 
cousin no one wants to talk about. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you take a look at the Meta Nexus Institute and the project we did there um, with uh, you know Catherine Hales and Don Ide and Andrew Pickering and you know the whole slew of academics who were saying transhumanism picking up on Fukuyama's world's most dangerous idea, they're full of crap, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, it's just a bunch of um, BS, um, highfalutin, utopian, silly nonsense stuff. And, um, but my question has always been, what are you doing to help solve the problems of the future? What is the postmodernist agenda doing, I mean, yeah, to, to help? I don't see any answers, I see it just criticizes modernism, criticizes humanism, criticizes the past, the past, the past, instead of, it's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Why not select the best of what we've done historically as a species, as a culture, as a society, as individuals, and put that together and then take a look and see where we could go and look at all the possibilities and potentialities. It's interesting that you mentioned Don Ide and some of those people who wrote these critical pieces for the Meta Nexus Journal. And it's very clear they really hadn't read much at all about transhumanism. They were just kind of picking out some things very lightly from the surface and saying, oh, but you guys haven't thought about this, and what about that, you fools? And honestly, they didn't know what they were talking about. So what we can do now is, so what I think you can do is, you can say, shut up, and throw our book at them. <laughs> uh, very weighty, very heavy, and they'll be stunned and go, oh, I guess there is more to this that I should probably find out about before I talk. I, and I think that that whole, that whole episode with Men and Nexus, um, if you don't know about it, I'll just give you a quick recap. I just happened to come across reading, um, and I know James Hughes had been involved with them, and he said to me, oh, you don't even want to bother dealing with these people because it's just, it, and it really was a no-win, and James was absolutely correct. However, I'm tenacious. I just have it in my blood, I don't know why, but I am, and so I, when I read what was written in one of the latest, they had this special issue on transhumanism, you know, anti-transhumanism, I read it and I thought, they never called me, and I asked several friends who, you know, are scholarly and knowledgeable and been around for a long time in transhumanism, did they call you? No. So I, I emailed the managing editor of this Global Spiral magazine, which worked with MetaNexus Institute on this, on this series of articles, and, um, I said, oh, why didn't they, I mean, I was really very, almost naive and dumb, why didn't they you know, at least interview us and ask us some questions? He said, well, how do you feel about it? I said, I don't feel very good about this, frankly. I said, it, it's, it's hurtful, it's insulting, and professionally, I'm embarrassed. You know, here's something that I've worked on for most of my uh, adult life, and here I'm, it's being criticized to such a degree that's embarrassing. He said, well, why don't you write a comment about it? So we talked and I said, I'm going to put together a series of rebuttals. So I went to a number of friends and I said, can you write rebuttals? And I think there was um, eight to 12 authors. I can't remember how many now, but we, it ended up being uh, another major issue, um, a special issue, and then the book came out um, trans, uh, H plus, H minus transhumanism. Transhumanism and its critics, it's a great book to read. It shows Catherine Hales, Don I, et cetera, Andrew Pickering, all of them d uh, criticizing transhumanism, and then I come back with, with the rebuttals with um, a series of authors countering what they say, and it's really done really nicely, and then they come back. Of course, they got the last word. So um, huh. I think that was, that was, I think that's a really good book to read as a primer to, uh, to these ideas, just to see, well, I guess, to see how foolish it is, these people saying these things without any uh, credible references. Yeah. Anneli? Um, so one of the things that was interesting that you guys were talking about when you were going over the table of contents and stuff is that it sounds like this anthology is a history of an idea, the, hi the idea of transhumanism. And I was curious, because you've got some of these really early essays and you've got contemporary stuff, like what are a couple things that you guys have seen that have really shifted among people interested in transhumanism, like things that really got them excited in the 80s versus the 90s versus the noughties, like what, what are like big trends that you've seen? In the 80s, uh, the term transhumanism wasn't used, it was just transhuman. And that goes back to FM 2030, uh, FM Sandiari, myself, and a few others in Los Angeles. Then I met Max, and, and he started writing about transhumanism in 1989, I think it was. But early on, just transhuman, going back to 1979, when FM first wrote the article in Women of the Year 2000, in that book, the last chapter, Transhuman um, 2000, um, great passion about space exploration, enthusiasm about new types of bodies, uh, of course, living indefinitely, but most of it was about space, and actually helping people that um, had physical 
um, inconsistencies and diseases. Um, there was a great compassion for people who were suffering. That was one of the main drives behind the concept of the transhuman. Um, and that, that absorbed most of our ideas. And then transhumanism became more of an intellectual. I was never an intellectual. It was a very big intellectual uh, movement early on um, through uh, transhumanism and expressly the philosophy of extropy. Um, yeah, I think you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of fascination with yeah, space because that, you know, we still had some hopes that might actually start taking off again. Uh, nanotechnology, of course, was big. Yeah. I think AI has grown. Um, that was around back then too, but now it's become you know big big focus. AGI. Um, I think uh, you know back then, eventually, bring about the singularity, but that wasn't a major part of this movement. Now it's become a very very powerful part. It's very, well, very seductive, I would actually say. Uh, so that's been a big change. And I think another change is that it, it tends to be either very near term, very near term in terms of what can you do right now, what nootropics can you take, or very far future, how do you build a Jupiter brain and uh, how do you colonize the universe. But I think over time it's, it's kind of stretched out and you have more focus on the in-between stages. Uh, the kind of things you were talking about, about scenarios of you know, a few decades, a century or so from now. So it's been sort of filling in the middle part more. That's yeah. been a major change. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, yeah. The I think the, the current situation of death, the immediacy of death, and the vulnerability of the human condition was always uh, precedent. Um, and then the far future, thinking about you know, great exploration and going through the, the solar system, um, expanding the human. But uh, I think there's a lot of um, psychological and sociological issues that were very important early on. Especially psychology was always very intertwined with the transhuman because of the mind consciousness and and looking at our foibles, you know, stupid mistakes we made. Oh God, why did I do that? And why did I say that? And if you could have had, you know, a smart brain, you'd be able to replay what you had said, and, and then you'd see more clearly um, what you intended and what you could have done wrong and how to, you know, um, replay it. But I think another big one I kind of hinted at earlier on, a big change has been that in the earlier days, it tended to be very much, you know, kind of the first type of fiction was the second type you were talking about, the aspirational science fiction, the way that this was aspirational reality, uh, without a lot of worrying about the problems, because somebody had to champion it. So it was all about, you know, here's what we could do, here's the great possibilities. Um, but over time, it's become more about, uh, I think it's gone excessively the other way, my own opinion is, it's overly concerned with risks and how it's all existential risks and how we might cause the end of the world. Very, very right, much, right. Little joy has, has won, basically, yeah. a large part of transhumanism. It's all uh, yeah. focused on that. So I think we've gone too far in that direction. Uh, and I think it's very important we consider those issues. But I think maybe we need to pull back a little bit towards the middle. Yeah, I think, I think Matt just made an excellent point that it's gone way too far in existential risk and the singularity in friendly AI and uh, you know just so much so that it's not looking at the fact that the future doesn't happen as we plan it to happen. I mean, there's tipping points, there's curves, there's the unknown, and it's not just one scenario of it. Uh, it never has been. So I, I think that. When we look at the singularity, for example, and we thought about this very carefully in the book, whether to include that in, and of course we had to, um, but we, we tried to look at it more balanced and look at the different concepts of it. You know, There's not just one singularity. Of course, Bernard Vinci has his original concept. Um, and then the, uh, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, of course, has his. But um, the, it's, there's so many different views that aren't discussed because they, they become the main names for it. And um, I think we need to take a look at what all is involved and look at the transdisciplinary aspect of, the, of that type of um, um, hitting the wall. Yeah, ironically, I think you know, singularity, as its name suggests, has sucked in all the other ideas and now it's all focused on this one, one idea, which has been very powerful. So I think to, this book, hopefully, it, yeah, this book yeah. hopefully will broaden the discussion. Yeah, I think we need to get back to some of the real issues that we're facing as a species, as an environment, as an ecology of people who want to live longer. And, and I think one of the great things that's happening right now, just in closing, is this whole area of looking at data and how we're you know, being more self-responsible. Self-responsibility has come back in fashion to where they are like, uh, not depending on other people like a doctor to tell us what to do or someone to tell us what to eat, that we can actually get our apps and learn about our body, learn about what's necessary for us, and make our own decisions about our future so we can take control of our future and our lives and become who we want to be. Put your hands together for that.
Thanks, guys.